Welcome to English with Afreen. In this listening test, you will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions. And you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write your answers in the question booklet. At the end of the test, you'll be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now, turn to section 1. Section 1. You will hear a student asking the social department of the university for information about the trips. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good morning. Good morning. How can I help you? I understand that the school organises um, trips to different... Yes, we run five every month. Three during weekends and two Wednesday afternoon trips. What sort of places? Well, obviously it varies, but always places of historical interest and also which offer a variety of shopping, because our students always ask about that. And then we go for ones where we know there are guided tours, because this gives a good focus for the visit. Um, do you travel far? Well, we're lucky here, obviously, because we're able to say that all our visits are less than three hours' drive. How much do they cost? Oh, again, it varies. Between five and fifteen pounds a head, depending on distance. Uh-huh. Oh, and we do offer to arrange special trips if, you know, there are more than 12 people. Oh, right. I'll keep that in mind. And uh, what are the times normally? We try to keep it pretty fixed so that, that students get to know the pattern. We leave at 8.30am and return at 6pm. We figure it's best to keep the day fairly short. Oh, yes. And um, how do we reserve a place? You sign your name on the notice board. Do you know where it is? Uh-huh. I saw it this morning. And we do ask that you sign up three days in advance, so we know we've got enough people interested to run it, and we can cancel if necessary, with full refund, of course. That's fine. Thanks. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now, listen and answer questions 5 to 10. And what visits are planned for this term? Right, well, I'm afraid the schedule hasn't been printed out yet, but uh, we have confirmed the dates and planned the optional extra visits, which you can also book in advance if you want to. Oh, that's all right. Um, if you can just give some idea of the weekend ones, so I can... You know, work out when to see friends, etc. Oh, sure. Well, uh, the first one is St Ives. That's on the 13th of February. And we'll have only 16 places available because uh, we're going by minibus. And that's a day in town with the optional extra of visiting the Hepworth Museum. All right. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, then there's a London trip on the 16th of February. And we'll be taking a medium-sized coach, so there'll be 45 places on that. And let's see, the optional extra is the Tower of London. Oh, I've already been there. Ah. Uh, after that, there's Bristol on the 3rd of March. Where? Bristol. 
B R I S T O L. Okay. That's um in a different minibus with eighteen places available. Oh, and the optional extra is a visit to the SS Great Britain. Okay. We're going to Salisbury on the eighteenth of March, and that's always a popular one because the optional extra is Stonehenge.、Ah. So we're taking the large coach with fifty seats. Oh, good. And then the last one is to Bath on the twenty third of March. Oh yes, is Bath the Roman city? Yes, that's right, and that's in the sixteen seater minibus. And where's the optional visit? It's to the American Museum. Well worth a visit. Okay, well that's great. Um, thanks for all that. My pleasure. Oh, by the way, if you want more information about any of the trips, have a look in the student newspaper. Okay. Or have a word with my assistant. Her name is Jane Yentob. That's Y E N T O B. Right, I've got that. Thank you very much for all your help. You're very welcome. I hope you enjoy the trips. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. In section two, you will hear a speech from a tour guide called Zanat about a boat trip around the Tasmanian coast. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fourteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fourteen. So, hello everyone. My name's Zanat, and I'm going to be your tour guide today, as we take this fantastic boat trip around the Tasmanian coast. Before we set off, I just want to tell you a few things about our journey. Our boats aren't huge, as you can see. We already have three staff members on board. And on top of that, we can transport a further fifteen people. That's you around the coastline. But please note, if there are more than nine people on either side of the boat, we'll move some of you over. Otherwise, all eighteen of us will end up in the sea. We've recently upgraded all our boats. They used to be jet black, but our new ones now have these comfortable dark red seats, and a light green exterior in order to stand out from others, and help promote our company. This gives our boats a rather unique appearance, don't you think? We offer you a free lunchbox during the trip, and we have three types: lunchbox one contains ham and tomato sandwiches; lunchbox two contains a cheddar cheese roll; and lunchbox three is salad-based, and also contains eggs and tuna. All three lunchboxes also have a packet of crisps and chocolate bars inside. Please let staff know which lunch box you prefer. I'm sure I don't have to ask you not to throw anything into the sea. We don't have any bins to put litter in, but Jess, myself, or Ray, our other guide, will collect it from you after lunch, and put it all in a large plastic sack. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions fifteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions fifteen to twenty. The engine on the boat makes quite a lot of noise, so before we head off, let me tell you a few things about what you're going to see. This area is famous for its ancient lighthouse, which you'll see from the boat, 
as we turn past the first little island. It was built in 1838 to protect sailors, as a number of shipwrecks had led to significant loss of life. The construction itself was complicated, as some of the original drawings kept by the local council show. It sits right on top of the cliffs in a very isolated spot. In the 19th century, there were many jobs there, such as polishing the brass lamps, chopping firewood, and cleaning windows that kept lighthouse keepers busy. These workers were mainly prison convicts, until the middle of that century when ordinary families willing to live in such circumstances took over. Some of you have asked me what creatures we can expect to see. I know everyone loves the penguins, but they're very shy and unfortunately tend to hide from passing boats. But you might see birds in the distance, such as sea eagles flying around the cliff edges where they nest. When we get to the rocky area inhabited by fur seals, we'll stop and watch them swimming around the coast. They're inquisitive creatures, so don't be surprised if one pops up right in front of you. Their predators, orca whales, hunt along the coastline too, but spotting one of these is rare. Dolphins, on the other hand, can sometimes approach on their own, or in groups as they ride the waves beside us. Lastly, I want to mention the caves. Tasmania is famous for its caves, and the ones we'll pass by are so amazing that people are lost for words when they see them. They can only be approached by sea, but if you feel that you want to see more than we're able to show you, then you can take a kayak into the area on another day, and one of our staff will give you more information on that. What we'll do is go through a narrow channel, past some incredible rock formations, and from there we'll be able to see the openings to the caves. And at that point, we'll talk to you about what lies beyond. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a discussion between two students about a film study course. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Joe, you know I'm giving a presentation in our film studies class next week. Yes. Well, could we discuss it? I could do with getting someone else's opinion. Of course, Katie. What are you going to talk about? It's about film adaptations of Shakespeare's plays. I've got very interested in all the different approaches that film directors take. Uh huh. So I thought I'd start with Janetti, who's a professor of film and literature. And in one of his books, he came up with a straightforward classification of film adaptations based on how faithful they are to the original plays and novels. Right. I've already made some notes on that. So I just need to sort those out before the presentation. I thought that next I'd ask the class to come up with the worst examples of Shakespeare adaptations that they've seen and to say why. That should be more fun than having their favourite versions. Yes, I can certainly think of a couple. <laughs> right. Next, I want to talk about Rachel Malko. I came across something on the internet about her work on film adaptations. 
and I was thinking of showing some film clips to illustrate her ideas. Will you have enough time, though, both to prepare and during the presentation? After all, I doubt if you'll be able to find all the clips you want. Mm, perhaps you're right. OK, well, I'd better do some slides instead, saying how various films relate to what she says. That should encourage discussion. Mm. Next, I want to say something about how plays may be chosen for adaptation because they're concerned with issues of the time when the film is made. You mean things like patriotism or the role of government? Exactly. It's quite tricky, but I've got a few ideas I'd like to discuss. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, You'll have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now, listen and answer questions 25 to 30. And finally, I want to talk about a few adaptations that I think illustrate a range of approaches and make some comments on them. Do you know the Japanese film Ran? I haven't seen it. It was based on Shakespeare's King Lear, wasn't it? That's right. It was a very loose adaptation, using the same situation and story, but moving it to 16th century Japan instead of 16th century Britain. So, for example, the king's daughters become sons, because in Japanese culture at that time, women couldn't succeed to the throne. OK. I hope you're going to talk about the 1993 film of Much Ado About Nothing. I think that's one of the best Shakespeare films. It really brings the play to life, doesn't it? Yes, I agree. And I think filming it in Italy, where the play is set, makes you see what life was like at the time of the play. Absolutely. Right, what's next? Uh, next, I thought Romeo and Juliet, the 1996 film, which moves the action into the present day. Yes, it worked really well, I thought, changing the two feuding families in the original to two competing business empires, even though they're speaking in the English of the original play. You'd expect it would sound really bizarre, but I found I soon got used to it. Me too. Then I thought I'd include a real Hollywood film, one that's intended to appeal to a mass commercial audience. There must be quite a number of those. Yes, but I've picked the 1996 film of Hamlet. It included every line of the text, but it's more like a typical action hero movie. There are loads of special effects, but no unifying interpretation of the play. All show and no substance. Exactly. Then there's Prospero's books, based on The Tempest. That was really innovative from a stylistic point of view. Didn't it include dance and singing and animation as well as live actors? Yes, it did. I also want to mention Looking for Richard. Did you ever see it? No, but I've read about it. It was a blend of a documentary with a few scenes from Richard III, wasn't it? That's right. It's more a way of looking into how people nowadays connect with the playwright. The play is really just the starting point. And that'll be where I finish. Well, it sounds as though it'll be very interesting. 
That is the end of section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a lecture on bird migration, which has been studied over many centuries through a variety of observations. First you have some time to look at questions, 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions, 31 to 40. Scientists believe that a majority of the Earth's bird population migrate in some fashion or other. Some travel seasonally for relatively short distances, such as birds that move from their winter habitats in lowlands to mountain tops for the summers. Others, like the Arctic Tern, travel more than 25,000 miles seasonally between the northern and southern poles. Bird migration has been studied over many centuries through a variety of observations. But until relatively recently, where birds went to in the winter was considered something of a mystery. A lack of modern science and technology led to many theories that we now recognize as error-filled and even somewhat amusing. Take hibernation theory, for example. 2,000 years ago, it was commonly believed that when birds left an area, they went underwater to hibernate in the seas and oceans. Another theory for the regular appearance and disappearance of birds was that they spent winter hidden in mud till the weather changed and food became abundant again. The theory that some birds hibernate persisted until experiments were done on caged birds in the 1940s, which demonstrated that birds have no hibernation instinct. One of the earliest naturalists and philosophers from ancient Greece was Aristotle, who was the first writer to discuss the disappearance and reappearance of some bird species at certain times of year. He developed the theory of transmutation, the seasonal change of one species into another by observing red starts and robins. He observed that in the autumn, small birds called red starts began to lose their feathers, which convinced Aristotle that they changed into robins for the winter and back into red starts in the summer. These assumptions are understandable given that this pair of species are similar in shape but are a classic example of an incorrect interpretation based on correct observations. The most bizarre theory was put forward by an English amateur scientist, Charles Morton, in the 17th century. He wrote a surprisingly well-regarded paper claiming that birds migrate to the moon and back every year. He came to this conclusion as the only logical explanation for the total disappearance of some species. One of the key moments in the development of migration theory came in 1822, when a white stork was shot in Germany. This particular stork made history because of the long spear in its neck, which incredibly had not killed it.
everyone immediately realized the spear was definitely not European. It turned out to be a spear from a tribe in Central Africa. This was a truly defining moment in the history of ornithology because it was the first evidence that storks spend their winters in sub-Saharan Africa. You can still see the arrow stork in the zoological collection of the University of Rostock in Germany. People gradually became aware that European birds moved south in autumn and north in summer, but didn't know much about it until the practice of catching birds and putting rings on their legs became established. Before this, very little information was available about the actual destinations of particular species and how they traveled there. People speculated that larger birds provided a kind of taxi service for smaller birds by carrying them on their backs. This idea came about because it seemed impossible that small birds weighing only a few grams could fly over vast oceans. This idea was supported by observations of bird behavior such as the harassment of larger birds by smaller birds. The development of bird ringing by a Danish schoolteacher, Hans Christian Cornelius Mortensen, made many discoveries possible. This is still common practice today and relies upon what is known as recovery. This is when ringed birds are found dead in the place they have migrated to and identified. Huge amounts of data were gathered in the early part of the 20th century, and for the first time in history people understood where birds actually went to in winter. In 1931, an atlas was published showing where the most common species of European birds migrated to. More recent theories about bird migration. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet. If you score 1 to 18, you are unlikely to get an acceptable score under examination conditions, and we recommend that you spend a lot of time improving your English before you take IELTS. If you score 19 to 27, you may get an acceptable score under examination conditions, but we recommend that you think about having more practice or lessons before you take IELTS. If you score 28 to 40, you are likely to get an acceptable score under examination conditions, but remember that different institutions will find different scores acceptable. Thanks for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. We really appreciate it.